You know, I didn't even realize that last night was the the fourth because, like, you know, they got the May the Fourth be with you, Sam. Oh yeah, I always forget about that. I'm not really a big Harry Potter guy. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry, Star Wars. Star, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, got him. <laughs> uh, I feel that Sam, I, I really do, because like, uh, well, either, on, really. on one hand, like. I did catch the last episode of the Bad Batch, and you know is. what an episode, you know. Like, what's what's the Bad Batch? It's the, a little the Star final trilogy, War. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a Star Wars spinoff it, that's all about like a uh, this uh, squadron of uh, defective clones, and like them being defective basically makes them the perfect uh, iteration of the the classic D and D style five man band. And the the only thing I really like cared about in Star Wars was like when the Clone Wars was out, you know, that yeah, was yeah. really good. And then there was that uh, that new show, I guess, that had like the the samurai with the the like oh, laser visions. Honor. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, they did a that couple good things with Sam- with the uh, <laughs> Star Wars visions, but then others are just like it. It either leaves you wanting more of a specific thing. Or like, oh, uh, there was just a never do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just we don't talk about it. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But hey, you, you ever try a Star Wars campaign? Uh, didn't we try one a while ago? It, it was a while back. Like, I remember making a character for one. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they got the rules online for it. But you know what? B- before I go off on a full tangent like that, how about we just start the show? <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, laser swords, and homebrews. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. Welcome back. And uh, we got ourselves an awesome guest this week. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, so I'm Lucas, uh, but most people know me as the Norse DM. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I got to see some of your work online uh, recently. It's like, uh, could you tell us, some of the audience a little bit about uh, what you do? Because I, I know you're on like a bunch of different platforms. Yeah, so I do a little bit of everything. Um, my main goal is to teach new players uh, how to play and, and give new DMs some advice to get their players more involved in their campaigns. But I also Ooh. go off a little side t- tangents and do you know funny stories from my decade and a half of playing um i've also currently got a homebrew campaign going that i'm very slowly posting on youtube uh, mm. we've done two sessions so far and i've only got the first part of session two up right now uh, and i'm currently moving into like monster compendiums to teach dms better ways to utilize monsters love that Yep, looks like we lost him. <laughs> yeah, monsters are a lot of fun. Um, and most of them have some really cool lore that not a lot of people know about. So, As of right now, I'm still just going through the uh, 5e monster manual. Nice. Uh, eventually, I will be spreading out, but there's so many monsters in 5e. Yeah, to, that are interesting that I want to work through. So, right now I'm still on that. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Fair enough. 
like you know that's what i tried to do here you know to talk about kind of the obscure monsters that maybe people don't know or don't you know know a lot about I, I heard of some uh, real interesting stuff when I was like uh, going through YouTube the other day, like a like a pie fiend. A pie fiend? Yeah, it's a it's a fiend that it's all like pies and shit, which is <laughs> which it sounds silly as fuck, but like at the same time, like we all know the nefarious uh, trope of uh, some uh, you know evil uh, little lady that's slinging cursed addicted pies and like ca causing all kinds of stuff like yeah when, when the cherry pie turns you into a slave like that, that, that's a little sketch i mean i i kind of imagine there's like yeah i mean like really what wouldn't someone trade their soul for i mean obviously uh the the biggest exception is like a klondike bar because like yeah. nobody wants those unless they're like crunchy <laughs> i mean maybe i like, I'm not I like the crunch awkward, ones but, but like it's really not that special yeah it's just an ice cream sandwich vanilla ice cream covered in chocolate that's all it is yeah. it, the, the thin crust of it just melts so easily <laughs> would you trade your soul for a Klondike, Sam? <laughs> That's the real test at how good a product is. Like, are you willing to inconvenience yourself to go and obtain it in the first place? You know, hmm. would like, you steal some dice? Would you sell some dice? Would you buy some? <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, stealing's bad yeah, unless it's fair. Law abiding citizens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the one uh, theft in D and D that I will not abide is like uh, someone taking advantage of a DM's goodwill and just robbing an entire magic item store. Oh my god! Oh yeah, that's a good way to get a uh, the big bad to show up a little early. Yeah, and I remember when we had a uh, we had one player in my last game. <laughs> he ended up using it like the entire game. Oh yeah, like a uh, oh one of the things that happened with that was uh one of the uh the player that initiated the theft ended up dying shortly after. Oh yeah, yeah. So like uh, the rest of the party's just kind of like coasting on that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know that that's uh that's karma. Like that wasn't even like uh you going out of your way. <laughs> <laughs> people don't know how vicious goose geese are like no, the, the canadian attack goose is a very supplemental replacement for a guard dog Mm. Sure. Um. Hmm. Um. I was running a campaign as a one shot for for my buddy's birthday. Mm. Um. And they were fighting. See, they were fighting a young dragon, and it tried taking off. And my buddy was playing an orc barbarian. Uh, my wife was playing a half elf rogue, and he decided it was a good idea to throw her at the dragon that was trying to <laughs> fly away. Um, <laughs> the classic oh, no. misses the dragon completely, uh, and she goes just careening off the cliff. Uh, and the fall damage just instant killed her. It was 
Yeah, that was all she wrote. <laughs> so, <laughs> and ever since then, uh, my wife won't play with that buddy because she doesn't trust him not to throw her character off a cliff. <laughs> There, there is a protective measure that people don't uh, usually utilize in D and D against uh, being part of the fastball special, and that's making your character overweight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, not a viable option with a half elf, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Two hundred fifty pounds of fat elf. <laughs> Try hey. throwing this, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> where does all the weight go to the ears of course to the ears. <laughs> <laughs> that is just a cursed mental image please no <laughs> oh Freyron, yeah i finally sat down and watched that because my wife was going all through it you know uh, it, it's, it's kind of weird as far as anime goes. Cause like it kind of hits that, that area between adventure, nostalgia and like slice of life. But mm -hmm. like, a, it plays itself off as a very, just kind of a low key kind of chill going through its paces. Meanwhile, there is like action and stuff going on. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it kind of makes sense. I mean, there are certain races in most fantasy settings that just live for an obscenely yeah. long time. And I, I would imagine there is a certain amount of emotional detachment that comes into play there. And I've seen some people role play it pretty well and others are just kind of like uh not not even bother with it and you know to, to each their own yeah but it's just like it's good for, like for uh, development but i think it's becomes tricky not to create like a bland character yeah because like uh it, it's easy to be like okay i want a, my character to be very kind of detached emotionally but like you have them, then like, you just yeah. yeah, it's kind of like when I played. Uh... Yeah, yeah, like he was trying to understand emotions, which kind of made him endearing. Yeah, otherwise, you fall flat like plank here. <laughs> He's very two dimensional. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Luke, what do you think of the uh, of uh, long lived races and role playing those? You know, I think everyone should role play their characters however they want. Mm. But as far mm. as it goes, depending on what the age of their character is, there should be some kind of. Um, what's a word I'm looking for? crassness some some kind of distance from their short-lived party members like if you've got an elf mm -hmm. that's that's running three or 300 years old and they're running with a party of humans that are all in their you know mid-20s to 30s there mm -hmm. there definitely should be like a an air of distance there between the party members because yeah this elf seen their friends come and go and now they're making yeah. new friends with what is essentially children to them uh and i've seen i've seen that happen and i've also had players that have run their super old elves as if they're kids with the humans mm -hmm. and halflings and and what mm, yeah you. definitely and and it works to some extent um there's always going to be some kind of disconnect when when you're playing that long lived of a race uh mm. comparatively to your to your party members so mm. i think it adds uh you know between like, the whys and like
you know what? It kind of reminds me of like a, the relationship that uh, teachers have with their students. Because like if you yeah. think of like a, the lifespan of a long lived race, like an elf, for example, versus like uh, the shorter lifespans of uh, kobolds, goblins and humans, mm -hmm. it's just like it's like being a teacher because like each generation as far as a teacher concerned is like a one year. That's a new crop, new class of students. And sure, you might get like a little investment, but there's always going to be a level of detachment because you know that they're just going to move on to the next thing next year. And then you're going to get a new crop. And it's like sometimes you just you're just going to end up fucking up names because you've seen people that look exactly like them before. And it's just like, you know, you're six months into the school year still uh, calling uh, uh, Chester uh, AJ or some shit. <laughs> 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 I don't know. But that'd be weird, like being a teacher. Yeah, like imagine being like so long lived that you know family members of your uh, uh, party is like, oh yeah, and you just keep referring to them by like their grandfather's name. See, it was kind of like cause I had another character that I... where it was a uh, a tricera, you know, and they're really old. He was probably like three hundred years old. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, he he had like the um, the knowledge domain, I believe. So I made him like very like old and wise, and like, <laughs> oh, you were all so young, like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that made for a good dynamic because like uh, the character I was playing at the time, Stormy, was just very youthful, energetic, and kind of like uh, all over the place. Oh, absolutely. So, Luke, what kind of uh, of all the stuff that you've worked on for your your content creation? What what would you say is your favorite thing that you like? Um, my favorite thing is is ragging on rules that I personally don't like. Um, <laughs> my biggest one is I really hate spell components. Um, yeah, I think they're That's nonsense. Really some of them. Like, yeah, like I don't, I don't understand why. Like for fireball, you have to have some bat guano to use it. Um, mm. It doesn't doesn't make sense. And so I personally don't run spell components. And I love it when somebody goes, "Oh, so you can just do like, was it soul prison requires a um, silver cage to to use right. it." I was like, well, what do you do in that case? Well, I have my players role play it. Yeah, you know, they describe what's yeah. happening instead. Um, so instead of the soul being trapped in the, the silver cage, they describe it like a, an ethereal green glow appears in in the shape of a cage and and traps their soul, or you know, something to that extent. Right. Um, yeah. And it's like, I don't like fall damage rules, but that's just because I don't like calculating fall damage it's not difficult yeah. it's just irritating yeah. um, so that's my biggest thing and those tend to do better um which yeah. is great because i enjoy doing them but i'm running out of rules to bag on so <laughs> yeah it, it is a little difficult i mean because like 5e objectively is considered of mo out of all the D D editions to be the most rules light yeah and it's like it's objectively not that bad, but I, I kind of like the I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Like, I, I always like the bare bones of it because, like, I've played other editions of D&D. &D, so it's just like, I'm just going to take all the stuff that I already have uh, jumbled around in my head for D&D &D rules, throw it in where applicable, and I have myself whatever I need on the fly, you know? Yeah. I think that's a good way to, to run any campaign for for any tabletop RPG, really. Um, I always, before I run a new tabletop, um, I go over the, the rules. And that way I've got a guideline of the way it's supposed to run. And then a lot mm. of times I'll change smaller rules just to make it like run better, uh, more fluidly. Yeah. And I, I personally think that's the best way to, to run any campaign. 
Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like the homebrew bastards rules are by far the best rules in my oh, opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you bastardize like a bunch of systems until you got something that your table likes and you're good to go. I don't like <laughs> how they do like they should do more (laughs) Hmm. yeah they could do a little more with that uh, they they can and have in the past like in uh, 3.5 there was the flat-footed condition where it's just like you lose your dexterity bonus to your ac you know, you catch someone off balance. Well, all they got is the armor on their back, keeping them safe. Right. And for some characters, that is detrimental, and others, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. But uh, Sam, what you got for the monster this week? Oh wait, Sam, <laughs> I w- w- I was talking about this, and you know been lazy for the longest time and Same. finally i think we might have a stinger for this uh, tell me how Let's this is unveiling the darkest secrets of the creature of the week <laughs> sam's monster lord <laughs> I could let it solo out a little bit longer, but <laughs> I thought that was fun. <laughs> mm. You make it sound like you're going to the store to pick up something. Like, yeah, uh, I was going to the shadow deals. plane, no, pick I, up I, a couple of bats and a Mountain Dew. Mm. Yeah, what what are you in the mood for? Right, exactly. But, you know, I saw something in like the footnotes of a page and I was like, ooh, what that? You know, <laughs> I was like, look at this freaky little guy. So I picked this one instead. <laughs> mm. <laughs> is is, is called... it something that we can actually have a real IRL fight score? Because most of the stuff you bring in is just like, nah, man, I can't fight that shit. Maybe, okay. Uh, I'll take maybe. Malagreen. Okay. Okay, so you said it's a malagrim. I'm going to go pull up a yeah, picture yeah. of that cuz Yeah, let's see D&D. Cuz I I've got to see what this looks like cuz that, yeah. that's a crazy description. Ah. Okay, kind of like a like a like a diet squid beholder. Okay. So, you know, we do love to give DMs, you know, 
<laughs> interesting ideas. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I... <laughs> I can see some ideas already kind of cooking up right here because okay. you're you're saying that like it's going to disguise itself in mm -hmm. as like a typical person, and then maybe if it decides to reveal its true form, things heat up. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Huh. Old was gradual memory loss and the decline of its cognitive ability. So the entire Malagrim hierarchy is like, oh shit, grandpa's gotten a little senile. <laughs> Time to off him. Grandpa's cooked. Let's get him. I mean, it is kind of like the, the animal kingdom, like. <laughs> yeah, that That is a classic trope for a reason. Could do without the uh, Oedipus uh, stealing the mother portion of it, but you know, uh, it, it seems like this one's got that covered. Well, it, I kind of assume that it's just like, uh, well, it says that it just steals the child, so like, yeah. They they could transform, so the the most practical thing for them to do would be to transform into like a a dude, because like you know transforming they're probably like some kind of like pretty close to asexual, like not really mm -hmm. being too concerned about having a gender outside of their transformation. So right. they go in, uh, they 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 knock a girl up, they they take the baby, and while she's incapacitated from you know giving wonder... birth, they're just out. See, that makes me, makes me wonder because, like, what if they just turned into, you know, like a woman, get, you know, get pregnant and then they leave? Like, you know what? That'd be a lot easier. That'd be, that's a lot more discreet. You just. Yeah, I mean, like, a, a Malgrim goes into a bar, uh, uh, finds someone. Uh, don't worry, it's a safe day for me. Ooh, okay, so now imagine, like, your party is in a tavern, right? <laughs> are you, are you are saying you? that the bard is going to father a Malagrim? Yeah. That's what it sounds yeah. like. That's how that's... Um, I love it! Yeah. <laughs> now we're cooking. Find out later that it stole the bard's baby, and then everyone's like, <laughs> oh, shit! They got your kid, bro! <laughs> I I love monsters like that. Anything that can disguise itself is is fantastic in my books. One hundred percent. So I like having uh, evil dragons be uh, in charge of certain cities. Yeah, and sending adventures on quests that could be like bad because they don't know they're yeah. just doing what the the leader of the city told them to do. When in reality, yeah. it's an evil dragon in disguise. So. Yeah, he's like setting yeah, like, you up to fail. Yeah, right? any intelligent believe, monster that uh, can transform is great. I think green dragons are notorious for seizing political power over cities. Yeah, yeah. and it's just like, damn, that, that's a pretty solid idea. Like, <laughs> if you want, if you're a green dragon that wants to expand your territory, just convince all the heroes in the city that you control that they're doing the righteous thing by attacking another dragon's territory. All right. Hmm. 
I can imagine a Malgram just having a couple bags of holding just to send some adventures to the astral plane once they oh uh, get a little too close. Like, you got enough time to figure things out. It's like, forget about it. Ooh, and then it takes all the magic items. It's just like, you know, th this NPC has some good magic items to start with. And like in the middle of the night, it takes your magic items and just jets with them. It like sabotages like fights and situations and stuff in like subtle ways. Well, I had something similar happen where like a, a there was a character that infiltrated my player's uh, camp by... Uh, well, it wasn't exactly pretending to be dead, but it, it was dead. But my brother was very, he thought he could get away with keeping the body for his own nefarious purposes. And then like, a, this happened to be the big bad who had a bad habit of re uh, getting back up after dying. Cause you know, far realm bullshit. Right. And so uh, he was being kept inside their bag of holding opens up the bag of holding, crawls out, takes that, stuffs it with more magic items, and runs with it. Damn. And meanwhile, the rest of the party was pretty distracted with uh, the uh, all the gold that exploded the airship, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. They had so much gold at the air. Yeah, one of the players used a wish. And wished for the treasure from uh, that uh, the water deep uh, module. Oh. <laughs> Fun. And it broke the hull. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. The ship just cracked in half. <laughs> well, they're set money wise now, so they can buy yeah, a new it, it was hilarious. It <laughs> And then they had to go through the process of like hiring the town to shovel all the money into a bag of holding, which was connected to like a vault and trying to hide uh, all the extra money they just got from their boss because the boss takes a cut. Oh. <laughs> there was a lot of corporate bullshit because it was like a acquisitions incorporated style game. Okay. <laughs> like... So while well, they sought power and food on the material. So Malagrams okay. were never a numerous race. So like Cousin Vinny was rude to me one time, so I'm going to have to spend the, the next hundred years kind of fucking him over. <laughs> Look, I buried him alive three decades ago. <laughs> he got out, but like you know, that'll that'll teach him. It was suggested that only the shadow master mm. Well, I think that right there, as far as any campaign goes, that kind of writes itself. Yeah. You, you deal with one, okay, it's part of some kind of clan, and uh, before mm. you know it, like, you're you're in deep trying to take all the magic items from these creatures that hoard them. Mm. Can't go wrong with Supreme. It's like the, it's like the best pizza. Wait, you don't like a Supreme? <laughs> That's fair. Except for like olives. Am I am I like a slug? 
<laughs> well, <sighs> they use those to make oil, so they're going to slide. Okay, so they're brown nosers. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 it's, it's me. I'm him. Like, <laughs> this is fantastic, uh, lore wise, because, like, <laughs> say your players are trying to be like, okay, we've arrived. We're finally going to battle the Shadow Master. <laughs> well, sorry, Mario, your princess is in another castle. <laughs> You're like, oh, what? That wasn't the Shadow Master? <laughs> <laughs> And then, like, maybe some of them tack on, like, extra little bits to their title. Like, you got Shadow Master Supreme and, like, Omega Super Shadow Master. <laughs> the Ultra Shadow Master. <laughs> so, the legends of the Malagrams claim that the race was descended from the human wizard Malak, said to be the first person to enter the plane of shadow. He became warped hmm. by Shadow Man, gradually transforming into the first of the Malagrams. The Malagrams further believed that their race's mother was an alien being from the encountered by Malag in his travels. Malagrams were thus easier, sorry, easier to travel to the Far Realm, search for their supposed parent, and in doing so, to acquire more power. Although they dwelt in the Plane of Shadow, Malagrams preferred the Far Realm to be their true home. The Far was, Realm is a crazy place. Like, there's very I mean, little that's you know, actually properly written about it in D and D. You know, I did a little like we did an episode a little bit on the Far Realm, and it was just kind of wild. <laughs> it's hard it, it's to weird. To it's hard to research. Like, uh, the Far Realm played a big part of that campaign I was talking about earlier, and like yeah. even then, when I tried to research it, there was not much to go on because, like, it's, it's, it's eldritch nonsense. Like, yeah, I mean, I imagine that you know they really do fill home there because it's like creatures like that, you know, it's the hundred older species and variants, like, and they're kind of similar, like, you know, yeah, you know, like you said, eldritch like nonsense. Hey, you know, eldritch nonsense is a lot of fun and open ended stuff yeah. like that where there's not a whole lot of lore, you get to put your own little spin on it every time you use it, exactly. so yeah. It kind of circles back to the bare bones are best bones. Exactly. You know? Like, if you got that going for you, you can build a house that has, like, a loose structure. Just got to be ready to, you know, put it all together. Yeah, well, improvisation is always key, you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And a great way to kind of keep things from going against, like, whatever canon you establish if you're establishing the canon as it goes. <laughs> Just remember to take your own notes. You'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> I forget to do that a lot. That's why I've started recording campaigns. There you go. That works too. Video don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually come in clutch a few times because I like I'll be going through uh, some of the stuff like, oh, wait a minute. I did say that. Write that shit down. <laughs> and that's why I've started uh, actually making character sheets for all my NPCs instead of just throwing random names in my notes. So now I know exactly who is what mm. and what they can do. And I won't get tripped up 10 sessions later. Oh, absolutely. And one, one of the things that I find that kind of is really useful, like if you want to have like a really fully fleshed out like stat block for a character, but you're like on the fly and just you don't want to like put all this stuff together and completely make it up either like if you have like a chat gpt uh tab opened up just be like hey stat block for this character the x y and z traits uh about this cr it like it's surprisingly good at generating stat blocks is like, it really right? oh yeah absolutely give it a shot i use it like for a, writing professional emails and that's about it <laughs> <laughs> uh, I tell you, like ChatGPT is surprisingly familiar with all kinds of D and D stuff. 
So it's just like, okay, uh, I need a creature that matches this description and uh, about like you can tell it a general CR and it will like generate like stuff that's kind of based on the average of what a CR whatever should have. Now, like everyone knows that CR is kind of a sucky system to oh, work absolutely. with, but it's it's a good baseline when you're using chat GPT to get like a roughly the power that you want. Yeah, I think, it's, I think the scaling works in some avenues. Yeah, because like you can wing it from that point forward. Yeah. It's just kind of like a little supportive way of winging it. So... Most folk of Faerun had never heard of the Malagrims, as their existence was very secretive. The first recorded instance of Malagrims living in Faerun was in the 3rd century DR, when a young Hellmaster clashed with the Malagrim Undarl. This was, in fact, a Malog in disguise, and the Malagrim progenitor was never again seen following his defeat at his hands. Man got wrecked and hit his face forever. <laughs> hey, you know, when you get your ass beat, it's time to hide. He was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> These humans are cooking. Dude. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> He's in the L protection program. <laughs> so, Malagrims were said to be perfect shapeshifters, able to freely adopt the forms of any creature, object, or person they wanted, as well as to transform individual pieces or parts of their bodies at will into whatever they wanted. The only known limit to their ability was that they could not assume the form of deities. Most Malagrims had two favorite forms, a normal semen human form in which they could freely travel among the people, and a more monstrous form which they reserved for combat. Uh, at least some of their shapeshifting ability was illusory as a Malagrim's form never inhibited his abilities. Malagrims retained their ability to fly even while transformed into flightless creatures as well. Okay. So even when they're transformed, you could like totally misdirect to them being something else entirely. Yeah. Like uh, you, you have one of these flying around. Someone's like, oh, shit, that wizard's already casting fly. So he's got concentration on that. If we break his concentration and like the players are like strategizing around that. Meanwhile, it's got another concentration spell all cooked up and ready to go. Just a thought. No, definitely. Well, when in doubt, just, you know, throw your half-elf at him. <laughs> the fastball special is the place to be. Let's get into their abilities here. I wasn't really able to uh, get a, like, a stat block or anything, because I believe they are, like, a 2E, 3E creature. You know, so, you know, those conversions can be a little tricky. Yeah, you know, what is fortitude and reflex? <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> so they were astoundingly agile, far beyond the kin of a human, as well as someone being somewhat stronger and more hardy than one. Their remarkable durability was in part due to their tactic of constantly shape-shifting during battle, often very subtly in order to move around or hide vulnerable sites or vital organs. Mm. Even out of, outside of combat, many would regularly manipulate their bodies in ways in order to make themselves more difficult targets for ambushes or add, you know, weapons or things like mm. that. Uh, their primary goal in most fights was to conceal their true nature, and in most cases, they preferred to flee rather than to be forced to reveal their true forms. Okay. So if I was to fight one, I'd have to, like, you know, kind of corner it and get it to run away. Yeah. And then, like, it'd be like, oh, fuck, fuck. I guess I'll have to whip out all the stops. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I, so... I guess so. Malagrims were notoriously quick to recover from wounds, which would seal up on their own with time. They were furthermore impervious to all weapons, save those which were magical or silver. Blows from silver weapons were particularly devastating and left wounds that the Malagrim could not heal naturally, instead requiring magic healing. Malagrims were also resistant to magical attacks, particularly from less experienced casters, and were further immune to all poisons. Malagrims also had combat training as wizards, although it was not unheard of to encounter sorcerers or clerics. In battle, they would make use of these skills when they wished to conceal their identities as shapeshifters. Otherwise, they would morph parts of their body into tentacles or pseudopods to strike. Despite how formidable they were as individuals, most Malagrims preferred to avoid direct conflict until victory was assured. 
instead sending minions or pawns to engage their enemies and using traps or illusions to beguile their foes. Owing to a human heritage, Malagrims could not be banished or removed from the material plane. Uh, so that's that not sounds me. troublesome. <laughs> that's a that would be a oh moment like <laughs> oh shit like. <laughs> I've seen so many people use that as a last ditch effort, yeah, and like, it's oh, just like, nope. get, it, get it away for a minute. And be like, nope. I picture it just kind of looks at you and it's like, let's try. Yeah. Bitch, I'm from here. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it would be a lot of fun to use, but really hard to balance the encounter on. Yeah, it would it would be strong. I don't know what kind of pawns it would have. Maybe like magical controlled like people, like charmed or whatever. They probably just have a bunch of people that it talked into being part of part of its crew. Oh my god, it could have its own party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to oh, the Freyrin uh, situation. Well, you know, feeling, it right? lives so long, so it's got uh, a. Per- like it could be like a guild master perpetually replacing a guild pawns. master. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> that would be rough. That is all I have. Or the guild master. <laughs> <laughs> I do have one last quote from a Malagrim that states, "But don't you see, or don't you agree that prey tastes even better when spiced with the sweet tang of fuel?" So, you know, spooky hmm. balls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know uh, about yeah. fighting one personally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give that like maybe like a three. <laughs> a three? That's saying you think it's easy? No. Okay. Then in that case, like a seven. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, what would you do to fight one of these, Sam? Oh, okay. So I would have to like catch on that it's a transformed you know like it's yeah like it's like it's you know i'd have to catch it like it's eyes glowing or something and i'm like okay so like a, okay. You, you figure it out no uh, knowing me right i would probably like i'd be like this isn't who i think it is you know i'm not gonna let him know that i know you know so i'm gonna i'm gonna go for him while he's in like the human form and then if he runs away, you know, and then transforms, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I don't know. If it has magic, I'm going to be cooked immediately. But, like, that would be, like, my only stipulation is if I can catch it while it's, like, in its human form. I should like. Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, what do you think, Luke? Could, could you fight one of these? Um, <laughs> it'd be rough. Um, with a party, we could probably do it. Uh, I am I always, no matter what, at the beginning of the campaign, as soon as I have any kind of money, I get silver weapons as quickly as possible. I, I think that's something so, people definitely don't like. Yeah, yeah I, I do feel that. Like, uh, last campaign I was in, like I'm like, okay, I, I got some silver, and I got a gun. I'm going to make some silver bullets just in case. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many things that are either immune or resistant to non-magical, non-silver weapons. And silver weapons are far easier to get than magical weapons, so why not just get them as quickly as possible? Better safe yeah. than sorry. So I would definitely have a leg up there um, against the Malagram, but it would still definitely be difficult. They they sound very, very strong. Um, I'd probably fight it to get it to run away, and then once it runs away, I would just nope off in the other direction and hope it doesn't find me. Mm. <laughs> So what what I'm thinking is like, uh, you know, you got your traditional battlefield, you know, you're like, a, you know, little fisticuffs and stuff. Uh, I'm thinking that I could convince this thing for a totally different kind of fight. Mm. Convince it to fuck instead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like they, they could transform. <laughs> so if I, I already got that suspicion uh, going on in this noggin. Hey, you know, you, you do you. It's, look, yeah, yeah. Bardly things. We don't we don't talk about bardly things. You know, it's it's exactly. mind your business. You know, you want to be that bard. Exactly, be my exactly. Guess, you know? 
and if you know uh, you're doing bardly things and uh, one thing leads to another and it eventually runs away because like you know you're, you're doing your thing but boom hey, victory is, is mine <laughs> so you know exactly a win is a win now this thing's probably been around for a long time so it'll be a difficult fight It'll be a very difficult fight would, in the bedroom. It would be tough no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like a creature like this, you know, it's going to gonna want to have control of the situation mm. at yeah, all you, times. You think they got that dommy mommy vibe? <laughs> they're, they're not going to want to be, you know, submissed by a human at least. Like, uh, um, you know what? Maybe, uh, you know, let, <laughs> that, that's, we could talk them into it. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah the the crux of my argument is i go about that way and slip them uh 20 gold to fuck off afterwards i mean you may not even have to then you say you get the job 20 bucks done, for a cab. on their own you know <laughs> <laughs> boom got him the real question is will your party ever let you live that down yeah. <laughs> uh, would my wife ever let me live it down? <laughs> I did it to save my life. You don't understand. They weren't who I thought they I, were. I was coerced. <laughs> they used magic, I promise. <laughs> yeah, you know, you do what you do. <laughs> all right, Sam. Is that all we got on those guys? That is all I got on those all guys. All right. Well, we I think do... they're fun. I think it yeah. leaves a lot of opportunity. You know, that, that someone really out does. there could be like, <laughs> you know, the, they they're plotters, they're schemers, they got family. the The misdirects are everywhere, so I highly encourage DMs that haven't tried these to just kind of like give them a shot. Yeah, like, give them a little look. See, you know, I always try to encourage. You know, looking into the the less talked about, less used realms to kind of like find your creatures. Yeah. Mm. Or, you know. And as far as like CR goes, like it's just ambiguously I, powerful. So just I do have believe, it be a little bit, a little bit stronger than your party. Yeah. In the one like stab lock that I was able to see, it did place them at around like a CR four. And I think that that seems, you know, yeah, moderately at the same, normal. At the same assuming time, assuming he doesn't have, have items. Have, so yeah, yeah. Assuming he doesn't have any crazy items or, you know, maybe like maybe just kind of like a, take a roll table with a bunch of like magic items and see where it goes from there. But imagine your party reading a Malagrim stash. Okay, that that'd be crazy. Yeah, that could be that could be interesting. But moving on, we got nerd news, Sam. Oh hell yeah. This is TNF, bringing you nerd news. So this week uh, from Dicebreaker, D&D Maker says it doesn't publicly address every AI allegation to protect artists' privacy. Hmm. And you know what? That, that That's a way of wording it. Like, they, they could have just said that they just don't want to address every issue because they... You know, they done goofed. Yeah, they like, fucked it a little bit. They're like, you know, we 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 don't we don't want to out our artists. You know, I mean, the fact that they're using the term artist and AI uh, in the same sentence is gonna it's gonna set a lot of people off. I would imagine. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, definitely. Like, it, it it's weird. Like, you you know me. I've been fucking around with uh, some. Uh, AI music stuff lately because I think it's fun to make uh, songs about people. <laughs> oh yeah, I I heard you made one about me actually. I I, I did. Uh, I'll play it at the end of the show because I thought it was really funny. <laughs> all right, all right. Although the, the one I'm really really proud of is the Trailer Park Batman. Trailer Park Batman, you say? Yeah, Trailer Park Batman. Dude, I <laughs> did you watch that video that I sent you about the Trailer Park Aliens? Uh, not yet. I I kind of forgot about that. There was just such a long it's, shuffle of things it's this week. So funny. <laughs> so anyone who may know, there's a there's a video. It's like a song of like a trailer park, and there's like some aliens that like break down or whatever in their yard. Mm. 
It's pretty funny. It's, like government it, shows up. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it, it seems like as far as uh, Watsi is concerned, though, like every week or two, that's a new AI allegation. And like, it, it's just something new. If someone oh. notices like some kind of art mistake in like a, a card or like in a book. And it's just like, I don't think they're actually trying. So like, maybe we should just stop pretending that, uh, you know, if they're going to do it, they should just either be all in or all not, you know? Yeah. They're like wishy-washy. Well, this way they're kind of digging themselves in a hole. So it's they have no choice but to double down on what they've already started because of how far they've dug themselves. So yeah, but yeah, nobody's buying what they're saying anymore. So it, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's weird because like some of the artists are. The, I think if you're gonna use art and be doing things of that level and in using AI for that, at least. If you're gonna lie, be good at it. You know. <laughs> you know if, you, if you're gonna take a shit, just at least have the decency to bury it. Cover your tracks. Wipe after. Wash your hands. Yeah, you know the the whole process because it it's not. I don't think it's necessarily Watsi's job to cover up for all these people every single time. No, they could be like, hey, you know, our, maybe our artist, you know, did. It's not really like, you know, even though we don't endorse it, it is what it is. I don't know. That, it, it's just ridiculous. Like, it keeps happening. So either, either just check over your stuff better or maybe. just, it, it, just, it just doesn't seem that hard to. You're either either all against it or you're good at covering up, and it just seems like they they can't even do that much. True. I don't know. If you're going to lie, just be good at it. Because like, words. <laughs> I'm just so used to Watsy lying about everything. I mean, like we started this podcast around the time of the OGL debacle, just like hitting the uh, internet waves and such. So the, our entire time, every time there's news, it's just, it's always what the always doing something, something <laughs> lying about something, uh, sending a uh, uh, hitman after people. <laughs> we don't want to have to talk about what but come on. So they do it to themselves. Uh, uh, honestly, Watsi, I'm tired. Give me some different news. But speaking of different news, uh, there is something interesting happening. Uh, are you guys familiar with uh, World Anvil? The uh, that yeah, yeah, the, the uh, little online platform where dungeon masters can like kind of uh, create a whole big old like a like a wiki uh, kind of work uh, thing that. All of your world building, countries, characters, and all, all this stuff. Like, just for being able to kind of build up your world and setting, and then easy access for players and such. Sure. Well, they are doing a, uh, once again, their world building awards for 2024. So, I didn't know they did awards for that. I, I didn't know that either until uh, just recently. Like, I got an email about it, and... It's interesting that like most uh, nerd sites don't that we use for getting our tabletop news don't cover any of this stuff. Yeah, and I mean we can definitely expect us to cover like the winners and stuff if it's on our. We'll, you we'll know, see where it goes, you know, because yeah. uh, a lot of DMs use World Anvil and they're having an entire contest to be like, hey, who is the world builder of the year? But they got different categories and prizes, so that's cool. Ooh, so people that have really put their heart and soul into building a D and D campaign might be pleasantly surprised by just uh, entering their stuff in. And who knows if uh, you got something good, maybe it'll work out for you. That'd be awesome. Yeah, they make you like an official like book or something publish it and everything yeah they got uh, participation badges 
a, a short list of works for nominees and, you know, winners for multiple categories, a physical trophy and, trophy. A, and a spot on the world building award showcase page. So being highlighted for your world building, like if your DMs, appre- if your, if your players appreciate what you've done with using that, and that happens to be something that you've used, maybe, maybe some of the DMs out there will uh, enter in their stuff. Can't hurt. And that is going to be judged and done on, let's see. So submission phase through yesterday to the 17th of this month. Uh So nice. And then first round of voting is going to go from uh, March 20th to April 3rd. Okay. Wait, oh, did I get the... Oh, wait. Okay, so the submission phase has already happened, and the awards ceremony is on the 18th. Okay. The the information was all kind of jumbled there. So, we can expect award uh, announcements later this month. Awesome. Yeah, Yeah, we'll definitely cover that and talk a little bit about it. For sure. But that's about all we got for nerd news this week. Nerd news. (laughs) All right. What you got, Sam? Like a do the homebrew? Yeah, you want to do the homebrew? Yeah, do the homebrew. Send us to the generic realms. Uh, the generic realms. Generic realm. Generic realm. Lots of fun. Excellent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Luke, are you familiar with the generic realms, the, the, the place where uh, everything canon in D&D and homebrew coalesces into the most generic of campaigns where anything is possible? You know, I'm not, but it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, the generic realms can happen anywhere. <laughs> so here at the generic realm, we like to search the internet and the, the pages, you know, for homebrew that kind of stands out to us and kind of gives some 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 love to the artists and to the creators. Yeah, yeah you know, the, the small content creators that put out the homebrew for yeah. people to just enjoy. So shout out to Dungeon Scribe on uh, Patreon. Ah. I bring to you guys the Devil's Grin. Oh, let it me just a, uh, pull that up on yeah. the recording here. Yeah, it's like a Three. like a half like samurai demon mask, you know, kind of gold with like a sm- like a smug kind of grin that goes all the way back to like deep cheek. You know? Oh yeah, okay, okay, L- little half mask thing. Yeah, cool. I like it. So it. Like it gives you the infernal language. Uh, Proficiency on your deception and your persuasion, plus two to your charisma. It is a very rare item required attunement. It says man can hardly even recognize the devils of his own creation. I like it. So the uh, off-putting nature of this mask only seems to be noticed when not worn, causing most common folk who witness it to not give it a passing glance. For others, the odd sharpened silver teeth and tusks jutting out of the golden mouth give pause. The hairs on the back of the neck give rise, begging one to steer clear of this metal grid. The user must attune for the mask to be worn, the assembly having no straps or buckles. Grants plus two to a charisma to a maximum of 20. Grants the ability to speak and write in Infernal. User gains proficiency in persuasion and deception if they are already proficient. If they are already proficient, they can stay at, gain expertise. Nice. Expertise in persuasion and deception. Oof. <laughs> that, that, that's uh, some big stuff right there. Yeah. When worn through a long rest, the user has 50% chance to grow a pair of tiefling horns. If they already possess horns, they would double their initial length. <laughs> nice. If attunement is broken, the horns will wither and chip away, leaving scars to forever mark their presence. <clears throat> After, so it has a curse apparently to it. After I, I do love curses. I also love curses. After a week of attunement, whether the user is offered a bargain or deal, or whenever the user is offered a bargain or deal, the target must succeed on a DC 10 wisdom save with disadvantage. 
On a failure, the user will agree to the deal bargain on any terms and strive relentlessly to complete without rest. This DC increases by two per week attuned, resetting on a failure. A full week passes before reactivating. Only a devil can remove this curse. Okay, that's a very interesting caveat there. Oh my god, you end up having to have a devil make you a deal to remove <laughs> you... the curse? <laughs> Requiring a deal with a devil, okay. That... And at that point, you may have just have to agree to it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, oh, I'm very happy that that item both has attunement requirement and a curse. Um, a lot of time I go through homebrew magic items for my campaigns, and yeah. there's so many of them that are just like really powerful with no drawbacks whatsoever. Yeah. And it's like, I can't even use those. There's no point to them. Uh, so it's great that it's got an attunement requirement as well as a curse. Mm -hmm. uh, and that curse just sounds like a lot of fun to to abuse. Yeah. I like yeah, that a lot. Absolutely. Like, I, I love just the concept of there's only one way to remove this curse. And I feel like a lot of DMs struggle with putting curses in their games. Cause yeah, like you have to have a way to, you know, break the curse at some point, right? Like, well, yes, but like the remove, curse remove curse comes online very early in yeah. most games. Like you, you get, it's a third level spell. If I remember correctly, totally. and it's just like, okay, well the, the curse is removed. I imagine that only works for like the most basic of curses, like uh, ideally, yeah. Could buy like spells, yeah. Yeah, I, I once had a, a curse uh, removed by the players by using the spell and uh, a ritual kind of uh, with it, and when they removed the curse, they had to put it into a new vessel. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like that's usually how it should work, and that's that's what I meant to bring up earlier when we were talking about uh, material components. You know, I definitely agree that a lot of spells can kind of like go without them, but I feel like uh, like rituals and stuff. It's very thematic to have the components. Yeah, um, but I think I think that works. Yeah, now. Like, like any the resurrection spell should be ritual only, and it should still require its components. Uh, yeah. Maybe not the component, if I remember correctly, or requires like a diamond of, of a certain value. Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of a weird one. Mm. Uh, yeah. But it should definitely be ritual and require some components on in that particular instance. Shouldn't be able to just do resurrection yeah. on a stick. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah. I like the idea of like maybe something that held value to the uh, target. Yeah. Yeah, something personal. It's like, oh wow, the he only carried one thing, and that's the sword on his back. I'm sorry, bro. We're gonna to have to sacrifice your sword <laughs> to bring you back to life. Motherfucker, that that was like the best magic item I ever had. He's like, I'd rather be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I like the idea of like, you know, having a sentim a sentimental value. Oh, definitely. But yeah, I like that. I give that I give that an item a ten. I would definitely use. Would definitely give to a player. <laughs> <laughs> ten out of ten would curse a player. Absolutely, yeah. cursing players is oh, always 100%. fun. <laughs> mm. Recipe it's... stonk. He's forever yeah. cursed. <laughs> I, I feel that. Like uh, maybe one day we'll uncurse the stonk. Um, Look, all curses all are right. removed in death. You know. I mean, <laughs> unless it's on dead curse. Oh, then, yeah, there you go. You know. <laughs> That's when it gets interesting. All right. So this week in, uh, you know, in uh, conjunction with all the Star Wars-y uh, stuff. Right, right. You yeah. know, it, it's basically Star Wars week. We get it once a year. Damn nerd. Yeah. We got the Ancestral Laser Sword. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a not your traditional lightsaber. Kind of looks more like a glowing buster sword ish kind of a design. So that's cool. But it says here, like, the uh, weapon is an anti matter dagger laser half sword laser sword. Okay. Well, very futuristic, but you know, that's kind of a that's the vibe. Hmm. Uncommon requires attunement. 
passed from generation to generation, this blade remembers each master who has wielded it. When you roll a 1 on an attack roll using this weapon, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. Living weapon. Uh, the weapon grows in power as you gain levels. At Love fifth, that. You gain a plus 1 bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this weapon. This bonus increases to a plus 2 at 11th and a plus 3 at 17th. Nice. Ancestral property. Uh, when you find the laser sword, it has a property determined by the wielder Ooh. that carried previously. The GM chooses the sword's property or determines it randomly. And there's a little D6 roll table here. I like that. Yeah, I like the idea of like it could change depending on who wields it. So like, say uh, you have a, a, a character die and then one of the other party members takes up the weapon, mm. the magic of it will change. Yeah, it like takes on a, like a property of that party member. Like, yeah. That would and, be really cool. His spirit kind of lives on through it. Yeah, and like you t could totally flavor it up that way. So yeah. let's see. Uh, first on this little D6 roll table is blind sight. So while attuned to it, you have blind sight to a range of 20 feet. Within that range, you can effectively see anything that isn't uh, behind total cover. Moreover, you can see an invisible creature with that within that range, unless the creature successfully hides from you. A little caveat there. So not perfect blind sight, but pretty good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Communion. When you spend 10 minutes communing with spirits of the sword, previous wielders. Oh, that is flavorful as fuck. That's like the avatar state. Nice. You can choose the arcana, history, investigation, nature, religion, or technology skill and gain proficiency with this skill until next dawn. And your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses that proficiency. Okay. Yep. So temporarily guided by the spirits of the those who've wielded this before. I like that. Then number three, we got covert. While attuned, you are when you are hidden and a creature discovers you with a successful perception check, you can attempt you can reattempt your stealth roll. So on a success, you silently reposition yourself and the creature doesn't notice you. Nice. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again for a long rest. Nice. Okay, that that's actually very interesting. I could see that being very useful mm -hmm. to, like, say, uh, the right. clunky paladin yeah. of the party that has oh, yeah. a chance at being able to stealth. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's really good. I was thinking, like, you, you give this to, like, a like a rogue in, like, a dagger for him, you know? But, like, that'd be really cool, too. Oh, yeah, that's totally doable. Number four is a little uh, shorter. A leaper, while attuned to the sword, your jump distance triples. Which, that's Break just cool. God, yeah, man. yeah, it's basically permanent jump spell. Damn, nice. Which, that's just cool. Then at number five, we got telepathy. So while attuned, you can telepathically speak with any uh, creature you can see within 30 feet of you. You don't need a language uh, to, you don't need to share a language for it to understand your, uh, te doesn't, you don't need to share a language to, for it to understand you. But the creature must be able to understand at least one language. And I like that these aren't like combat based. Like yeah. Combat -based. Like it uh, says flavor wise, it's based on the previous user. Yeah. And then returning when you uh, tune to the sword, it has the, the throne range of 40 to 120 <laughs> feet. You can use a bonus action to call the sword uh, to you. If it's within 60 feet, if it's not, if it isn't being carried, uh, causing it to fly to your open hand. Nice. I'm sure you could hit somebody with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of just winging this thing at somebody. Then you like leave it over there and let your guard down. Then you call it back and hits them in the back of the head or something. Yeah, you know, kind of like uh, Kingdom Hearts with a keyblade. Never played Kingdom Hearts. Why? Oh, you should. Yeah, that that sounds like a fun magical item. Um, it once again, it's great that it's got an attunement because it is a very strong magic yeah. item. But 
so it's not something I would probably use personally, just because it doesn't seem to have any real drawback past the the attunement mm. requirement. Yeah, it's just kind of like a good yeah good weapon. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a I good like, flavor. I like item. that it uh, levels up with you, kind of too. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I like when weapons have that. Uh, yeah. Oh. Or like the weapons that like have like awakening, you know, or whatever. Those are always cool. Yeah, I do like those kind of weapons. I think I'd throw this in a game just because it, it's neat. I, I like the concept. Yeah, you could flavor it as different weapons. I think it's really cool. Yeah, I think that goes for just just about anything because like yeah, dagger, sword don't matter. But shout out to uh, Mage Hand Press who uh, brought this together because uh, they seem to make a lot of really cool stuff. Nice. All right. Well, that's about all I got today, Sam. Same, same. Uh, so, Luke, do you have any like favorite homebrews that you like to bring to your table? Um, not really. I kind of try and use something different every time. That way... My players don't know what's coming. Um, mm. It, I tend to have a lot of the same players usually, so I don't want them to be like, "Oh, we had this in the last in the last campaign." Yeah. Um, so I don't have any set homebrews that I bring in. Um, Understandable. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So, where can the people? find you uh, i'm on youtube uh as i think norse dungeon master is the full thing but if you search norse dm mm-hmm. on that search bar i'll pop right on up um i'm also on tiktok as the norse dm and then i'm on instagram as once again the norse mm. dm so nice. all Very right nice. and thanks for hanging out with us thanks, thanks for talking thanks for having me i had a lot of fun yeah, it's been great having you. And as always, uh, for our listeners, if you want to leave a voicemail, we're more than happy to kind of play those on the show. We don't ideas, rants, advice, you name it. We we just recently started that, so hopefully we get some calls coming in. Uh, I'm always excited to just kind of hear what the listeners have to say about stuff. You know? Yeah. Whether it's any in, kind of feedback, or, any yeah. kind of comments, you know, would be great. Yeah, emails and whatnot. But hey, that, this is Dungeons and Talk Shows, and we'll see you guys next week. See you next week. And there. <laughs>